What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the founders of P90X, Zapier, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Greg may be able to relate to these people, uh, Rise25, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, coaches, probably the same people using Thinkific, anyone working with clients one-on-one to stop just trading time for dollars and shift from one-to-one client work to one-to-many, more of a scalable option. Uh, you can go to rise25.com to learn more and download your free dream product ladder. It's basically a business plan on one sheet of paper that helps you see gaps in untapped revenue. Companies like Disney, Apple, the sporting industries all use versions of the product ladder it, and you can check it out at rise25.com. I'm very excited to talk to my Canadian friend, Greg Smith, co-founder of Thinkific, which is, it's a platform. They have a fantastic website layout. Uh, just for my conversion perspective, Greg, I love your, your homepage. And the Thinkific is a platform that is everything you need to create and launch courses on your own site. Greg, we'll call him a recovering lawyer, and for the past 10 years has taught thousands of students online with his own course, and now with Thinkific has helped many others create their own online courses because they make it drop dead simple because they have the platform for you to do it. Companies like Intuit, Hootsuite, and service professionals like I mentioned, accountants, lawyers, doctors, many more have used Thinkific. Greg, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. So I want you to take me back to 10, 11 years ago. Yep. Um, you were first preparing your course. You were a lawyer at the time, right? Talk yes. about what was going on in your life and what sparked you to create this, this online course. Like 10 years ago, that's like in internet years, that's like 100 years. So yeah. <laughs> what, what did it look like uh, at the time? I was, oh, I was teaching uh, classroom courses, so I was uh, renting a class at mm. my university at UBC, and I would uh, put posters up all over campus or hire someone to do it and then run a few ads online and try and put people in the classroom. Mm. Usually get sort of five to 15, maybe 20 mm. people in the classroom for the weekend, and I would teach them how to take the LSAT and mm. get into law school. And then my students just started asking for more, and they said, well, you know, and I would I'd, I'd chat with them after class and at the breaks and just think, ah, oh, there's so much more I could help you with. I was doing some, a lot of private one-on-one tutoring at really, really good rates, but it was still, like you said, dollars per hour. Yeah. So I started creating some free resources, a lot of blog articles, and just threw up a really simple website and shared it with them. And what my students cost loved at it. At the time, the class that they showed up in person to, I think it was around four hundred, uh, four to seven hundred dollars. Kind of depended on whether. Sometimes I would do a two weekend thing or a one weekend mm-hmm. thing. So it'd be maybe for like a whole like six hour, eight hour day or something like that. Yeah, I do Friday night for Mm -hmm. five hours and then eight hours, eight or nine hours Saturday, eight or nine hours Sunday. And then they'd come back once or twice for for an exam. I think it was actually more. It was like 600 bucks for that. It's pretty intense. Yeah, it's been a while. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So then what did you do? Did you film that? What made you decide to, to actually go online with it? That, well, it was the blog. So I put the blog together and just honestly, it was a couple of articles I wrote that I got sick of sharing the same information with people over and over. So I, I put these great articles together. And then anytime someone would ask, I'd be like, you know what? I got a great article on it. Here it is. Here's the link. Check it out. And if you still are really, in, if that doesn't answer all your questions, I can do some tutoring. Mm-hmm. But then I took it. A, my brother actually saw all this and he said, you know what? Why don't you put together an online course? I can help you build it. So we started uh, building this online course and really just Initially, I was doing kind of voiceover PowerPoint slides, and the first couple iterations were more voiceover slides. And then I got a little video camera and started just shooting in my living room and shot a bunch of videos and put them up on the website. What made you decide to start that in the first place, the classes in person? Uh, You were a lawyer at the time, right? Yeah, and it was just, it was recognized. Well, at this time, even I was, uh, I think I was still in, it was still in law school. You were still in law school at the time, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was, um, and it might even be more than 11 years ago now if that was, uh, so that'd be 2003 I started law school. So mm-hmm. back around then. Um, 
And uh, it was that, I, you know, I could put 10 or 15 people in the classroom, but that was just the people I could reach who were 100%. in Vancouver, yeah. able and, and free on that weekend to get to where I needed them to be. And so as soon as I went online, I saw thousands of people reading my blog. And, uh, well, you know, for the first few months, it was like, hey, I think I had a reader today. <laughs> exactly. Atlantic shows me I had one visitor. I think your brother went, yeah, on the site. Yeah. <laughs> But then it was just recognizing that, okay, I can put 10 people in a classroom once every month or two, or I can put thousands of people through an online course. And that was really the deciding thing is that I can spend, you know, 30 hours building this online course and then more improving it, uh, but get it in front of thousands of people instead of spending 30 hours busting yeah. my butt, try and put 10 people in seats and then have to do it all over again next month. Yeah. And you said something really smart and I, th I don't want to gloss over it. And we tell people this too. If you feel like you're getting the same question over and over and over and you keep answering it over and over on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that it's telling you something. There's a question that people are, first of all, it's important for them. And second of all, you can do it in more of a scalable fashion, you know, with which you did with the courses. But what did the landscape look like for your first online course? If, if the solution of Thinkific existed, at the time, you probably would have never created it, obviously. What was, what was going on at the time as far as the online course landscape? Well, we did look around for a solution just like Thinkific, which is essentially what we were looking for is something that off the shelf, we could build uh, kind of a marketing site around my course. We could build the course itself. We could give a really awesome student experience. That was kind of my first closest to heart need is that great mm -hmm. student experience. Because uh, I know if they're not successful, my business of teaching them won't be successful. Uh, and then, of course, the e-commerce piece to it. And we found a whole bunch of complicated solutions or solutions where you had to mash five different things together and do a bunch of programming. Uh, and But there really wasn't anything that was going to do it easily. And we actually looked for a good couple of months and then gave up and um, just decided to build it ourselves. Really? So yeah. you started building it at that point. Are you very technical or is your brother very technical? No, my brother's a software developer, so he, oh, he yeah, built so it. Okay. And the first version was not, so this is a long time ago, and it wasn't Thinkific. It was just us building our own mm. you know, uh, self-solution to this. And then actually Thinkific came later when people saw what we did and started asking for us to do it for them. Yeah. So I want to transition to talking about Thinkific, but I want to ask first, what for you worked getting the word out for your course? And probably some of the same things that are kind of built on, you know, Thinkific is built into Thinkific a little bit. Yeah, it was, it's a combination of things that have worked well for me. Uh, some was, I mean, early days I had this blog. So because I'd been writing and getting that shared a little bit, that worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I had the, once I launched the course, I had a small amount of consistent blog traffic. So that was a really good place to start. And that got us our first sort of 10 sales. Right. Um, of the online course and getting the word out that way. And then I moved into a few other things. Um, guest blogging on other people's sites was mm -hmm. somewhat helpful. Um, YouTube was a really big win for me. And really? I produced about, yeah, it, that one, that kind of turned the tide a lot. Is I produced only about 12 videos, uh, relatively short, um, had a really specific format in terms of what I did with the videos. And it was really understanding that when people go to YouTube, they're just looking for free videos. That's their that's what they're there for. So if you try and push them to do anything else, you lose most people. So instead of trying to change their behavior, I said, hey, you're here for free videos. Here's a free video. And if you want more free videos, come over to my website, just click here. Mm -hmm. And when they did that, they would just put in their email. They'd get more free videos in a free trial of the course. And then eventually they'd get a bunch of emails and they'd get prompted to yeah. sort of upgrade and buy the course. But that was a big win for me on the, on the bringing new people in early in. Yeah. So Greg, at what point did you have to make the hard decision to stop practicing law and transition, <laughs> right? It's just kind of a scary thing because I think at one point I, when I was doing research, there was a point where you started making more in the online courses than you were making as a lawyer. Yeah. And so that was years later. I, I finished law school and then I, I articled and practiced law for three years. And, uh, and yeah, eventually the online course really had, had taken off. Again, for me, it was always this side passion project. So right. we would put a few hours a week into it and just continually to gr grow it. And uh, eventually it started doing really well. Uh, definitely took a while because we weren't focused on it. But when it did go, uh, that's when I, I jumped ship and, and you did. left law. So was it, did you have in your mind when this overcomes this, I'm going to switch or was it a harder <laughs> decision than that? 
No. And in fact, I mean, there was even a business in between, uh, you know, left law did something else and then came back to education. Uh, we did actually, uh, touch screens and taxi cabs for an advertising business. So we'd put in hardware inside cabs and then sell advertising on them. That's right. Huh? Were you ahead of your time at that, at that point? Uh, no, screens? it worked, it worked it well. Okay. Uh, in fact, the, they're still out there in the cabs. Wow. I just, uh, my real passion has always been in the education space. So I did mm-hmm. that for a bit and then moved back into online education. So did you do that? You were still building up the course at the time when you did the touch screens in the cabs? Yeah, I, I had didn't at that point I was so focused on a new business that I didn't, I kind of left the course mm. as my, as my side revenue. That's the beautiful thing about it is because it's no longer dollars per hour. Yeah. You get that course going and it's, uh, it can sit there and pay the rent or the mortgage right. while you're doing whatever else you want to do. So was it a hard decision to leave as a lawyer? Uh, I mean, there, it's kind of, I mean, it's a stable job, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I, in my first year of practicing, I, I on my vacation, I took a trip to Asia and I read this book. The um, uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of it, The Alchemist, and it's book, uh, yeah. it's, it's it really kind of pushes you to sort of pursue your passion and dreams. And so I wrote a little journal article, and there was a period in The Alchemist where he kind of takes a year of like polishing crystal at a tea shop before yeah. he actually goes off on his journey. So I said, okay, one year, that's my goal. I'm going to be out of this in one year. Hmm. I love law, but I know there's something I want to do even more. Like I didn't leave law because I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. But there was something I wanted to do more and in education and in business and it being entrepreneurial. Yeah. And so I kind of wrote myself this journal and it took me two years more instead of one year more. But uh, I think I always knew I was going to make the shift. So mm-hmm. it wasn't that hard of a decision. It was certainly a bit scary to take the leap and, and yeah. leave the the consistent paycheck for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Was it but, partially a freedom thing or what was driving you? Um, I'd say the the real drive is in, you know, for me, the, the fundamental driver in everything I do really has always been about helping other people to achieve their goals, dreams. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I love teaching because I can get in and when I teach someone on the LSAT and they go and do well on it, and then they get into law school and they send me that email. I just got one actually last week from someone who took our course years ago wow. who says, hey, I'm, on a, I'm at a, a Bay Street law firm, totally having an amazing time, uh, love my career, and it all started with your course. Thank you so much. And it's like getting those emails now still brings tears to my eyes because that's exactly why I got into it is like I find when you share knowledge and education and you can, to me, that's the most powerful tool for affecting positive change in the world. Uh, yeah. And so that's why I jumped into it. That was like the, the big motivating yeah. why for me. So, Greg, did you grow up in an entrepreneurial household? It seemed like you always kind of gravitated towards starting, you know, companies and your own thing. Yeah, I did. Even I in did law school, my... I mean, that's pretty entrepreneurial. You're just starting. I mean, most people aren't starting a class where they're charging people and doing two sessions. You know, what was it like growing up? Were your parents entrepreneurs? Uh, my dad's a, uh, a doctor, but he, which is, you know, arguably there's some entrepreneurial stuff in that cause you start, you have your own practice, but really, you know, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's directly the entrepreneurial journey, but, um, he always had the, the crazy ideas going in the garage. Mm. Um, was there was always, yes, yeah, so, everything from a worm farm for, you know, generating proper, uh, really cool. I think it was called black gold, the, uh, the um, plant fertilizer that, w- that comes out of worms and they generate I didn't know that. So the more okay. organic stuff all the way to the really high tech, like inventing new flying machines. Mm. Um, so that kind of stuff was always going on on Sundays in our garage. So I think mm. that was probably a big driver for me. So one thing that you talk about is non-scalable things. I like your yep. take on non-scalable things and you did it. I want to hear what you did, what was non-scalable about when you had your course, cause you have some really cool stories and then, non-scalable pieces of thinkific but start yeah. with the the course you did some you know not everyone would would do these non-scalable things <laughs> well is there is there any i mean i i definitely did a lot of non-scalable things yeah. and i truly believe in starting out that way yeah and uh and it's funny because sometimes the non-scalable things turn into scalable things but i did i definitely did i mean i did posters on campus to sell the course i did uh phone calls. Um, and when I got into other courses, I did a lot more phone calls. So I just call up businesses and say, we have a course in this, you know, who should I talk to? Are you interested in taking it? Um, we, uh, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other the one really I'm not thinking scalable. of is where you actually allow people to call you. Oh yeah. Yeah. I still do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm still, I'm still very non-scalable in that way. And, uh, I, I get, I get, 
you know, a couple calls a week still on my LSAT course. You and, do really? uh, yeah, oh, I, I try not great. to let it interrupt with the Thinkific business. And it's, you know, I only spend about an hour a month on my course now. And most of that is taking those inbound calls. Mm -hmm. But yeah, especially early days with the online course, um, I put it all over the place. Uh, a lot more so then than now. I had a uh, 1-800 number and my cell phone number all over the website. Call 24-7. I would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go from dead asleep to, hi, this is Greg Smith speaking. How can I help you? And, you know, my my wife now, girlfriend at the time, would, would not love it. <laughs> but, I'm uh, sure, yeah. Uh, but I knew that that phone ringing, I had something like an 80% close rate on those mm -hmm. calls because most people, they'd already been on the website, they'd already checked everything out, and they saw this number and they're like, oh, there's a real person behind there. Let's just call and and make sure that it's not a scam or something, especially early days online courses. But I think even now it's super relevant. And I would take that call and they would have one question like, so if I sign up for the course, I get access right now. And I'd say, yep, they'd be great. Okay, I'm going to sign up. I'm like, hmm. it says that on the website, but they just wanted to hear someone tell them that. Right. Or they might have two or three pieces of advice they were looking for. I would give it to them and then they'd sign up. Um, but it was amazing how much of a difference that made just being able to take that call. So I still do that kind of stuff today. I still get on, on calls, uh, every week with clients of Thinkific in a very non-scalable way to just really help people out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, it doesn't matter if they're on our highest tier paid plan or they're on yeah. a free trial and they just want to chat with someone. Um, I can't talk to everyone, but I, I make sure that I do that yeah. because I think it, it lets you stay in touch with people and learn what's working and yeah. what's not. I mean, we tell people that, Nothing bad has ever come from listening to your customer, you know, like whether it's, you know, whether it's negative or positive, that's going to help you shape and make what you're doing better. So yeah. I love that you do that. Now from the Thinkific piece, right? So non-scalable, obviously, you know, you talk to customer, any other non-scalable things for, from the Thinkific uh, side of things that you do? Um. I, uh, I, I'd say a lot of times when we're starting something brand new, it might be non-scalable. Um, so if you're experimenting with a new channel, um, we, uh, we've, we've done things where, yeah, we just, you know, reach out to people, try and set up a call, go and have, meet them, have dinner with them, find out a bit more about how they're working, especially if we're trying to get into a new segment or work with a new group of people and find out better about how that works. Um, so I'd say, we're, we are at a point now where we've got our scalable channels really f figured out. So we still, most of our stuff is, is more scalable, but yeah. I, but like I said, anytime you're doing something new and experimental, it's all about, um, get out there and do that in, and, uh, and then get the data on it. So even on the software side or, or anytime I hear someone saying, Hey, if we're going to do this, we've got to set up this whole thing, sign up for all these accounts, build this big thing. I'm thinking, okay, is there a way we can do it? Even if it's not scalable, let's just do three right. or four iterations of it, get the data before we commit a bunch of right. money. Right, right. More of the lean startup model than just exactly. build it. Exactly, yeah, and, we still do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So how has that non-scalable, those conversations shaped Thinkific? Obviously, you built it because you had a need for it. What yeah. uh, what has come out of some of the conversations that helped shape the, the product of what it looks like uh, now? I mean, really, the vast majority of the company, not just the product, but the company itself is we're so heavily driven, I think, partly because I am um, yeah. driven by this. But everyone who's joined our team is really driven. And mm -hmm. we call it being fanatical about customer success mm -hmm. and just uh, really, really caring about each person and recognizing. And we had a point a while ago where our our inbound support queue, so people emailing for some help from us, uh, sometimes it was taking a day or two to get a response out of us. And so we all sat down, talked about it and said, imagine you're trying to start a business you're, or you're trying to grow your business by adding this online course. You check out our tool and you write us an email saying, help, I need some help with something. And it takes us three days or a week to get back to you. How horrible is that? Yeah. Like that, that you could have taken that week off to try and build this. put us in those, sh in that person's shoes. You put yeah, everyone and so in that we, person's shoes. We brought the whole company together and said, whatever it takes, we're going to make sure we're answering um, uh, all of our tickets every day. So we're we're really focused on yeah. getting through like our whole ticket queue every every day and clearing it out so people don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, someone waits a little bit longer, especially if it's a super technical thing or something like that. Right. Um, but for the most part, we try and get to everyone. And just even that piece. And then everything within the product is heavily influenced by those yeah. conversations. Like talk fine. about something that you didn't have before and you kept hearing a few people like, we need this. <laughs> because here's the thing, you probably get who knows, thousands of requests every month. You can't do all yes. of them, right? So yeah. what are some of the ones that you 
you feel like you just kept getting over and that was just groundbreaking for Thinkific. Yeah, I, well, one thing is that we're just uh, getting close to releasing um, the next big iteration of is we look through our all of our conversations with clients and, and the most consistent theme we saw was mm -hmm. people needing help uh, building out and uh, the website around the course and making it really look good and making mm -hmm. that process easy. And, uh, you know, we did have the ability for everyone to go in and edit all the HTML and code and do it themselves, but it really wasn't sort of point and click, drag and drop. So we've spent the last year investing heavily in building out sort of a super easy drag and drop, essentially website builder with a whole series of themes that are just yeah. going to make it. You're like, really? Easy. We have to do website builder too? That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's a pretty big expansion of the product. But like you yeah. said, we wouldn't have gone that way if I hadn't been barraged constantly week right. after week with clients asking for that. So yeah. that was that's a good probably example yeah. of going that path. Any other, and then you have lots yeah, of little yeah. wins. Yeah, like, talk like, about the little ones, yeah. Well, someone just coming in and saying, um, it'd be great to be able to uh, randomize my quiz questions. So I want to be able to upload a whole bunch of quiz questions. But then every time someone takes a quiz, it selects a random sampling of those quiz hmm. questions. So we added that in and it was that's a relative a weird easy quest. That's add. a weird request. Yeah. And then you'd be surprised how many people are really interested in yeah. something like that. So, yeah. Cause, and I'm sure integrations must be a big one too. People yes. probably are daily adding or wanting you to add integrations. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we, we actually been doing some bunch of surveys recently trying to figure out what is, what are the most interesting integrations for people. I'm finding right now that still what people most ask for is on the marketing side. So mm. I want to integrate it with my marketing or emailing platform. Yeah. Um, so we do have emailing built into Thinkific, but not yeah. at the level that you would get from a, a really dedicated email yeah. marketing automation platform. So that's where we get a lot of requests for integration there. Yeah. And so we have a lot of integrations to support that. And yeah, that's all driven by clients asking for it. Yeah. So yeah, I would think that'd be a common question because I went and I was talking to my business partner, John, John Corcoran earlier today because, yeah. um, you know, people have different opinions uh, very strongly about, oh, a Weber MailChimp in Fusionsoft. And I, you know, my biggest selling point to him is Thinkific has an integration with Infusionsoft, right? So um, if not, you'd be like, well, you know, you're kind of, people are kind of tied to whatever email piece they use, mm -hmm. right? What other important integrations you f did you feel you made uh, that made a difference with, you know, because that's probably objections you're getting from people, I would assume. Yeah. And I mean, the first and most basic ones are the payment ones. So things like Stripe and PayPal, that's just like table stakes for us because we have to be able to process credit cards and payments yeah. for people. Um, that's been a big one. And then data and analytics as another one. So we have our own data and analytics and reporting inside Thinkific, but then there's a whole nother level that people are looking for from things like Mixpanel mm. and Google Analytics. And then yeah. you mentioned it, I think at the top of your show, Zapier has been an excellent one because Zapier's- They connect know. everything. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they can connect everything, yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely been a really good one. But I mean, the the trade off with Zapier for us is is uh, um, it does have to go through the middleman. So we try and offer both options. If you can go through Zapier, or we have a direct connection if you want to do it a different way. Yeah. How was the yeah. transition from going from course creator? Now you decide that you're developing a whole platform. I mean, yeah. lawyer to I guess taxi cab touchscreen to <laughs> course creator to now you're developing a whole platform. What what was the, the tough parts early on or was your brother instrumental because you have a developer in-house? Uh, we'll definitely have an inter, uh, uh, developer and he's more than that. I mean, he's his own founder now. So he's gone off and started a company, uh, later.com around social media marketing mm. and schedule, visual social later. media Later.com, com. that's a good domain. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, they started as Latergram and now they're later.com. <laughs> cool. Well, it's just later, but I find if I just say later, then, you know, you think I'm ending the call or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What was the tough part um, early on? Early on, some of the difficult stuff, I would say, uh, honestly, the first three years. <laughs> the yeah. first three the years in figuring years, out no. what, I mean, we had this really yeah. cool original idea, which is basically yeah. Shopify for online courses, but it took us three years to get there. And in the interim, we iterated through so many other different business models. We tried an approach kind of like Udemy. We tried an approach kind of like Pluralsight or Lynda.com, where we would create our own content and market it. Uh, or have that marketplace more like Udemy. Um, and then we ended up coming full circle right back to the original idea. So that mm. that first period of like, I guess Seth Godin would call it the dip, 
where you're like trudging along and, and you get this initial bit of success and then you go into this dip and psychologically that's the most difficult period of just, you know, mm. when you're not, I mean, I'm not in business to be honest, to make money. Um, that's the measure of, of you're doing things right because people are willing to pay for right. the services that if you're providing. If they value it, then they pay, right? Yeah, and it and it allows you to scale it. But I'm really in it around the helping and the teaching and, and helping other people grow their businesses. That's what really gets me excited. But when you're not making much money, which we weren't in the first few years, you're. it's this constant question of why am I doing it? Is it like, does anyone even care? Are we really helping people if we're not finding enough people who are willing to pay for it? Are we doing the right thing? So the psychological battle I think you go through in that yeah. first little bit until you really hit product market fit is really tough. What kept you going in the three years? Because you could two I'm, years you could be like, well, that taxi cab thing was working. Let's go put more touch screens in there. <laughs> what kept what kept you going? I'm just a bulldog. I just don't <laughs> give up. You know, I I knew that there was something here. I knew yeah. I really wanted it, and I knew from enough conversations with potential clients that there was something there that people wanted. Yeah. Um, and I was just, I'm, I'm, uh, I just, I'm stubborn really. Yeah. <laughs> I just persist and don't give up. Yeah. I asked because there's a point where, okay, like you saw something there, but someone could yeah. have easily been like, well, um, this isn't working. Right. Yeah. So I, I could just be stupid too. Keep going, <laughs> and at what point do you decide, no, this is. This is not working. You know, it's not what the market wants. But you saw something there that the market wanted something. Yeah, and it's not like we had no successes in that three years. I think yeah. if nothing had happened, I, we would have walked away. That would have been the smarter thing to do. But we did see enough successes of like, hey, wow, we've got this client who's willing to, you know, we didn't have a SaaS business model set up. We weren't charging a monthly subscription fee. You couldn't even put your credit card in on our website. But we would find one client who'd be like, I'll give you $30,000 to set this up for me. So that was that would keep us yeah. going for a few more months. Um, let us hire someone potentially. Um, so those little wins along the way was an indication that there is something here. We just figured it, haven't figured out the perfect product market mm -hmm. fit and how to scale it. Yeah. So what was that turning point or milestone that you look back on? Maybe like after the three year mark. Um, there's never any one like this is the thing we did, but um, it's sort of a collection of paper cuts. But I would say it was right. a few things. Of, Die by paper cuts. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was a or like a, a yeah a collection of band aids of healing all the little cuts. But um, it was the slow transition back to we're gonna we're gonna do what we wanted to do, which is we're gonna give people it's their site, it's their brand, they have full control, make it really easy to build the course and give an amazing student experience, and make sure that e commerce and being able to generate revenue is a big part of that and and ingrained into it. And as soon as we really got back to our basics that way, things started to take off in a very non-scalable way. So even then, uh, we you couldn't pay us by credit card on the website, and we would call people up, talk about their course. We'd get them to Dropbox us or email us their video files. We'd mm. build the course manually, and then we'd give it back to them. It's like and then a I'd white call glove them up service, again. sort of. Yeah, and then I'd show them what we built and say, okay, can I take your credit card now? Um, mm. You know, often over Skype. <laughs> That's interesting. And, uh, and then once that worked for 20 or 30 people, we turned on pay us online and sign up and do it yourself. And that's when it just, that's mm. when you see the, all the graphs just suddenly take this nice inflection point and take off. Do you still offer a white glove service like that? If someone said, <laughs> hey, we want to use you, how much would it be if we just gave you the videos and you put them on or whatever? Or is it just so drop dead simple that... Doesn't even uh, matter. Both. So it, yeah. it is super simple. So so when people ask us to do it, um, we can usually find a way to do it for them. Um, usually it's something like, you know, sure, sign up for one of our annual plans or pay us a little bit up front in advance and we'll throw that up there for you. But yeah. usually I tell them, I'm like, why don't you take five minutes, go in? Because we have a bulk uploader. So you can literally connect your Dropbox or connect your box or, or connect your drive uh, or just drag and drop your videos in, and it builds the whole course automatically. So if they ask us to do it, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we still do a bit of that. I mean, one thing I want to—I have start. I have two things start that I want to make sure to talk to you about. One is customer service. I mean, it's very apparent you deeply care about customer service and building teams. And the second thing is um, around pricing, um, because I'm curious about that piece because. I'm like, this guy's crazy as a free plan, for one. <laughs> but um, because there's there's hard costs involved in this, you know, um, and you, staff time and customer service time. Talk about the customer service piece and 
um, building the team. There are certain questions you go through to really build a rock star team, which is kind of the foundation of your customer service, I would say. Yeah, and we um, that's that that has been a tough one, and we've been very lucky with the people that we found uh, and super um, disciplined about hiring there. Um, we don't go in just for someone who's customer service. I mean, you have to have all the awesome client service and relationship building skills. But on top of that, we actually need technical skills um, because we have a technical product that's easy to use, but we want to make sure our whole support team really understands it. So that if you're trying to do a, an integration with Infusionsoft and there's something complicated going on behind the scenes on Infusionsoft that isn't even within our product, we'll actually go in and help you out with that. Um, or, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with how to use Zapier and you want us to like almost do that for you, kind of like Zappos will order a pizza for you, right? We'll go right. in and actually set things up. We actually spend time helping people with software products that aren't even our own. So we really wanted people who understand technology and are really comfortable with it and are amazing with client support. Uh, so that's been a big part of it. And then how we hire the team, we really follow essentially a top grading process, which is um, a pretty extreme series of interviews, um, really looking at historical performance and digging into past. And um, it's a it's an amazing system. Sometimes you end up hiring the people you would never hire from gut feel uh, right. or not hiring the people who would be a slam dunk from gut feel because the process tells you otherwise. Yeah. How did you come to that process? Did you have uh, someone come in and, and help you with that? Because again, that's a different skill set from all the different entrepreneurial things you have to do. Yeah, that one, uh, there's a really good book called Who by G.H. Smart. And then, of course, Top Grading, which I think uh, uh, Jeffrey Smart wrote with his uh, mm -hmm. dad, actually. Um, Who is a more simplified, easier to kind of implement version of it, easier to read, I'd say. Top Grading is the more technical manual. So read that, recommended by a coach of mine. Um, and uh, and then from there went and took a seminar uh, on that and brought our, our hiring team to go and, and do the seminar and learn a lot more about how to do that better because we were already doing it. But then when we took, you know, we actually got coaching on it, we realized, oh, there's a lot of stuff we could do better than what we're doing now. Uh, so that that really helped us level up in doing that. What particular, Greg, what particular questions do you find helpful to ask so it's not just a gut feel, but it's you're getting to <laughs> kind of the core of the person because I feel like it's hard to do that. Like we yep. always have that gut telling us, well, yeah. So the, the biggest thing I would say as part of the process is that you, um, I don't really ask about what ifs or future scenarios or role playing. I always go back to, um, their entire employment career. We go all the way back to school hmm. and then in each of those different sections, we'll go, um, we're, I have specific things I'm looking for. So if I'm hiring a, a developer, we know exactly what kind of skills we're looking for. If we're hiring support, we know what kind of skills we're looking for. We'll try and identify areas where they've done something around that. And then we go deep. So if you tell me, if I ask you, give me a story about how you had a conflict with a coworker and how you resolved it. And you tell me this wonderful unicorns and rainbows story. Uh, <laughs> that's your interview story. Now it's right. my job to go 15, 20 questions deep. Okay, good. Tell me more. Okay. And then what happened? How did that person react? How did you feel afterwards? What did you do the next day? What was that relationship like going forward? Like just uh, basically it's an interrogation, but you do the whole thing. They're with crying smile. in the corner uh, at the end. And people love it. Yeah, they come away like uh, I, that was the most amazing experience. I had a great time. People, it's an enjoyable experience from the interviewee's perspective. And we get so much great detail and it, it works both ways. Sometimes you have someone tell a story that doesn't sound very good and you dig deep and you find out that they're actually kind of self-deprecating and they don't really mm. sell themselves well and they're actually a superstar. Really? You just didn't realize it until you dug deep and found out that they were totally responsible. Or they tell you how they re they increase revenues by 20% in a quarter and then you dig deep onto that and uh, realize that it wasn't really them that did it or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but you get an exorbitant amount of applications every month. Yeah, we do about uh, 3,000 people that's, applying here a month. That's Hire wild. Less than 1%. <laughs> do you tell them all, yeah, we're not hiring, but you should get a court, they should get a, you know, they should get on your platform. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's 3, a great idea. New we customers. don't. <laughs> um, we, uh, we're not hiring, no, and but we, if you like, create our, your our course, team is amazing. You we actually don't have need to us. go through. Yeah. <laughs> All those people should be getting uh, getting uh, on your platform, I think. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> we'll just start marketing to the applicants. That's yeah. <laughs> Three thousand a month. That's that's amazing. Um, yeah. 
so I want to talk about pricing for a second. Yep. Because I went to your site, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, I always wonder about the free. What was the thought process of free? Was it always? Did you always have a free plan? Uh, yeah, I think we started out with it and, um, our earlier pricing model was more heavily based on us taking a percentage of your course sales. Mm -hmm. And what I found, or at least thought there was that people were, uh, you know, the most successful people or the ones who thought they would be most successful would be less likely to use us if they thought we were going to take a cut of their courses right. in the long run. Right. So a big, big pricing win for us was actually removing those percentages on any significant, like if you're paying us 99 bucks a month, we don't take a cut right. um, or, or anything more than that. And, and so that was a pretty big win from us. And we actually saw things turn around a bit, a lot. Um, the free plan, it was always there. We do take a percentage on the free plan. So yeah. if you, the kind of the concept there is just, look, this is your opportunity to get started, play around with everything, build out your course, yeah. get some students in there, start selling it. And as soon as you see success, the features we have on our paid plans will encourage you to move up. And then mm -hmm. us taking a small percentage of your course sales, if you start to be successful, you're going to want to move out of that tier and not give yeah. us a percentage. Um, toying with the ideas of getting rid of the, the percentage entirely and, and actually changing some of our pricing completely in the near future. We're, we're looking at that anyway. Um, of course, we'd grandfather people yeah. in. So in you better market. get it now while yeah. the prices. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think our prices are, are probably a bit low. And part of that is intentional as a land grab because there's a lot of competitors out there and really yeah. trying to get out there and be the best platform um, with, uh, you know, affordable prices. Yeah. Uh, so that's, it's, I mean, I think the free, us. the free piece, I think is overly generous. I mean, it's hugely generous because I know probably from that you get a lot of customer service requests and someone maybe just getting started. And if they don't have skin in the game, they also may, Oh, I'm already paying. I better put my courses up. I don't know if they're motivated to, to do it. And it takes up probably a lot of customer support. So I would say if they're thinking about eliminating the free plan, anyone should sign up. But um, <laughs> oh, no, we're not. I don't know if we're going to eliminate the free. Okay. We just uh, change some of the pricing and stuff like that. But um, it's uh, yeah. The, the that's a big decision. I mean, a big decision. Yeah. I'm sure you had many conversations to to decide to do that or not. I'm yeah. Just, well, we're doing a lot of research now, so no, nothing, nothing firm in the pipe. So you know, don't you're not sharing this publicly yeah. with anyone, right? <laughs> not right now. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the so how did you come to the ten percent? Because I also think that's pretty generous um, for the free plan. Yeah, I mean, that honestly, there was an element of that early price. That's still sort of remnants of the early pricing, and it yeah. was kind of just pulling it out of, well, this seems reasonable. Um, we wanted it to be enough that if people did really well, they'd want to move up, but not so much that they'd be worried about starting there in the first place. I mean, really, for most people, that's not even not a significant issue. They start out on the free. They build everything they need yeah. to get it launched. They see some success, and then they move into paid plans. Yeah. What are some of the most popular features that you find people are using? Um, well, one of the one of the actually back to your question of what people are asking for. We just recently got groups out there, so this is the ability to actually group students. And mm. so it's a it's I find it to be such a cool feature because you can use it in so many different ways. So if you're a you know running a <clears throat> you're selling to corporate clients, you can create groups for each corporate client you have, and then give custom reporting to them based on their groups. If you're doing mm. cohorts where you have new people starting each month, you can put them into cohort-based reports. Mm, that's cool. Um, lots of different really cool ways of doing that, and then some of the interactivity. I'd say you know from a I don't even know if it's a feature, but within our course player and student experience, we've built in a lot of gamification. So it's not something you typically advertise as a feature, but it is gamified. And it, what it does is it significantly increases the completion rate of our online courses. So yeah. people who take courses on our platform are more likely to finish and get value out of it because of some of the stuff we've built in. Um, yeah. And it's not really a feature that you would turn on or off. It's more just it's gamified into right it. into the platform. What's something yeah. that would be an example of a gamification? Because, I mean, I have... I mean, with books, I don't know the stat on courses, but it's like 90% don't even get opened, right? Yeah. And probably yeah. there's there's really high stats that may surprise people on they get the course and they don't even view it. Seven seven to 14% uh, completion rate on your average online course. Yeah. Um, it's horrible. Ours is, is definitely all over the board. It depends on whose course it is and sort yeah. of 
how much work they put into it and how much they listen to us about how to build it. But um, uh, on the high end, I've seen 80, 90 percent completion rates on our platform, which is pretty that's, awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So what are some of those gamification uh, components? I know so it's, it's, there's a progress bar. I think I was watching a video and there were a bunch of a bunch of features in there. Yeah. So little things like uh, tracking progress is a big one, essentially giving people a digital pat on the back quite frequently. So, you know, you, you finish a lesson and you can give an update as to how, how far you are and what's coming up next and how much is left. Um, a, a big one is we have sort of formative assessments, which are these little quick quizzes you can insert between videos. And that just lets you uh, confirm that they were paying attention. So every ideally every sort of two to seven minutes, you're putting in a quick one or two question multiple choice quiz that mm -hmm. is super easy and basically just says, hey, were you awake? And they get 100%, so they get a little bit of kind of endorphin rush and, and encourages them to keep going. Yeah. And then it stimulates that human desire to um, get everything right and mark it complete. And then little like, you know, green tick boxes on the things that you've got done. People um, want to check those boxes. Yeah. yeah. So it's the little things like that. It's not, they're not huge, massive changes, yeah. but it, you'd be surprised. And we've got a lot of science behind it. So we do a lot of studies on what works and what doesn't. Um, our own studies and then read a lot of research from universities and PhDs on what they're doing that way. And then we implement that in the product for people. That's really cool. Yeah, because on the consumption side, I mean, the bottom line with a course or anything is you want to get someone results and you can't get them results if they don't consume it. Right. Yeah. So that's really important. And then on the, the front end, obviously, you want to get people into the courses. So I want you to talk a little bit about the marketing side. Um, because I think you've built in some marketing pieces so that people can better market their, their courses. Uh, yeah, so there, there is stuff there. You have, um, some ability to email your students and, and leads and people who are signing up or potentially signing up. You have things like free trials, um, which was actually a huge win for me on my own online courses. Mm. And I've seen it work really well for a lot of people is, um, giving them a free trial, not on like get access to everything for free, but, um, give them one or two things, just, you know, 10, 15 minutes of content for free. And then they have to move to the paid version mm. that works really well. Uh, marketing and sales pages. So in our themes and new themes, we have marketing and sales pages built in and then all sorts of widgets you can drop in like countdown timers and stuff that work well for the conversion and, and sales and marketing perspective. Uh, and then as you mentioned earlier, a lot of integrations with other products. So if you're already using an infusion soft or, um, MailChimp or ConvertKit or something like that, we tie directly into it so that you can market using your existing stuff. Yeah. So Greg, on the free trial side, um, let's say someone has an eight week course or something like that, eight to 10 week course, and they want to offer maybe one or two of those weeks. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you charge for that instead of a free trial? Like, can you charge like a lower amount and then with the possibility to upgrade or is it just a yeah. free trial option? Yeah. Yeah, you could, there's a, our, our e-commerce site is extremely flexible. So you can do, because we have the ability to package and bundle different products and courses together, you could do everything from a full membership site to having something like that, where the way I'd actually design that is actually probably have the, the cheaper initial couple of weeks trial piece uh, as one course, and then the other piece as the more expensive second part two of it. And then you can sell them individually or together. So you can package them or you could buy one and then Got upgrade it. into the other one. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's another good way of doing it for sure. Yeah. So what have you seen is worked well outside, you know, that's within the platform. They can email from outside, getting new prospective people, um, to purchase like marketing wise, I guess you're probably, yeah, it kind of depends on, on what pulse. stage you're at. I mean, yeah. I love uh, a lot of the stuff Danny Any talks about. Um, he's got some, some great, uh, strategies for getting started. So if you're early on in the case and you have um, that ability to go and and um, get your first 10 or 15 people in to just try it out and, and learn from them, uh, then a lot of the non-scalable stuff, so even just calling people up or reaching yeah. out and setting up a call where you do, I've seen people do well where they do a free 30-minute coaching call and then say, you know, I'm not going to sell you anything on this, but they say, look, I'm looking at doing an online course. Is that something you'd be interested in? not going to, I promised I wouldn't have kind of a sales call here, but if you want to talk about it, we can set up another time to talk yeah. about it and see if they're interested. That stuff's, you know, very non-scalable, but it's a great yeah. way to get your customer first research people in. Yeah. Yeah. And then what about and then moving the, uh, into, yeah. uh, and then all, all the other more scalable channels, everything YouTube works, I still see work exceptionally well and I still use it a lot. Um, every Quora, even like the question and answer sites, getting on there mm. and, and answering people, people's questions in a really meaningful, helpful way, and then referencing back to your course. Um, 
I find for people who are more new at it is doing the things that don't cost money because you can you can spend too much that way uh, and pick sort of one channel and then just go deep on it and see if it works for you. So don't do one YouTube video, one Quora post, one blog post and one, you know, Facebook ad. Pick one thing and go kind of deep on that and see if it works for you and then move on to the next one if it's not. I know you've seen a lot of people get a lot of results with webinars. Yep. How have you seen people use webinars that it's been most effective to sell courses? Well, it, it, uh, it depends a bit on where your audience for the webinar is coming from. So if you have your own audience, that's great. And you're already, if you've already got your own audience, you're probably somewhat familiar with this stuff. And you can, if you have an audience of people, you can just reach out to them, invite them in, do the webinar. Um, another way to get people into that is uh, reaching out through other people's audiences. So the borrowed audience. And that could be a software company. It could be an influencer. It could be someone like you that people follow online and say, hey, this guy's got exactly the kind of people I want to be talking to. Maybe we can do a webinar with them. Uh, I find the, a great way to start building those relationships is to reach out and do something good for the people you're trying to connect with. So whenever I'm trying to build a relationship, I always start from a give like, hey, what can I do for you? What's your most important business objective and how can I help you do that? And so sometimes that's just interviewing someone and, and you know promoting that to your audience or even putting a couple of ads behind it and getting it out there. Once you've got that relationship built or you've got your own list and you're going to start running uh, a webinar, uh, then I find uh, giving value. So this, it, everything I do in terms of marketing is is making sure that when people show up on that webinar, I'm actually giving the value I promised. So you need to have some value proposition to bring them to the webinar. Right. They don't, if you send it out saying, I've got a webinar that's going to sell you my online course, you're not going to get a lot of people showing up. <laughs> not a so, good copywriting, not a good headlines, yeah. not so good practice. So then you end up writing this beautiful story of, I want you to come to my webinar because I'm going to teach you how to do this. If they then show up and what you do is bait and switch and try and sell them a course, then that's not going to work well. You can sell the course and you should sell the course, but start by delivering on your promise. Yeah. So usually for me, it's about here's what I'm going to teach you. You come in and and you actually deliver. Um, uh, I was actually watching some stuff with uh, Dan Martell uh, recently, and he does uh, he does some good stuff on webinars. But one thing I've noticed about him is when you show up to watch a webinar or you watch his YouTube videos or you, or you catch him, um, and, uh, and I know you're actually similar this way, uh, with your interviews and everything you do is you add real value, right? Like people don't come and then walk away going, Oh, why did I come here? Like you really try and give valuable, actionable advice and get specific. And even like the kind of questions you're pushing me to answer of like, that's a good story, but give me something specific each time. Like you probably asked me something specific three or four times on this. Uh, so I know you're really trying to give value. And I think that's, there's so many different formulas you can use, but really, to me, it comes down to start by giving true value first, and then whatever you end up trying to sell or offer or convert to after that will work way better if you come to sort of legitimately and faithfully give value to people yeah, first. Yeah. Well, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that. And um, so what objections do people have? <laughs> you probably overcome every objection over the, under the sun to, yeah. to use Thinkific. So to specifically use our platform, I mean, the big ones are more less about our platform and more about should I do a course? So Oh, really? Yeah. They're not it's, sure if they should do a course or not. Yeah, it's it's more people figuring out, like, is a course right for me? Should I add it to my business? Um, how am I going to do this? Hmm. Um, do I have the time for it? I mean, do I have the time <laughs> is one. Hmm. Um, I do teach and train people, but I do it live and in person is another big one. So doing the, the time thing, I mean, I started mine, we actually called the project uh, Mondays at 9, I think it was, and Mondays at 9 p.m., uh, we would get together, or was it Tuesdays at 9? Mondays or Tuesdays at 9? We'd get together at 9 p.m. So I was working. Oh, 9 p.m., okay. Working and studying crazy hours, and so I'd get together at 9 p.m. at night for however long I could work until I fell asleep, and that's all the time every week I had to build my first online course, and I made a commitment that I would get something launched within the first month. And that was totally reasonable. I did it and a bunch of people bought the course and it went well from there. So on the time side, I'd just say, just carve out a little block in your calendar and say, I'm going to commit to getting it done. Yeah. The Should I do it because I like to teach people live and that's really the only way to deliver my content. I have yet to meet anyone of hundreds of people I've talked to where we couldn't take what they're doing live right, 100%. and help them get it into a great like, Wait, you want to keep doing it over and over or you can record it and put yeah. it on a website and have people purchase it 24 hours a day. 
Yeah. And nice. you can make it interactive. You can have case studies. You can have yeah. engagement. You can have communication. You can have group work. All that kind of stuff can start to happen through an online forum. And then you can even say, well, look, I'll do most of it online and then I'll do some of it live online or through yeah. a Skype call. Or, it's a paradigm you know? shift for some people, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, th that, I was not expecting you to say that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> what? That, that the I, limitation is, should I do a course? Or? Yeah. In the time, yeah. I was thinking maybe... There's some kind of feature that they're looking for that they haven't found, but it's really kind of the basic. They aren't sure yeah. how to integrate it and do it in their their busy life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the features we ran into that in the first few years, uh, you know, oh, you don't have this. I really want that. Um, but I'd say at this point, our products mature enough that mm. we generally have. 80, 90% of what everyone wants. Yeah. And yes, people still have a, oh, it'd be really cool if you had this thing, but it's usually, it'd be really cool, yeah. but you have everything I need. So if you build that in the future, it would be great. Um, or we can talk to them about why we don't want to build it because yeah. maybe it'll actually hurt. Sometimes what you think is going to help on the courses is actually not going to work as well. But more the, most of the objections I have is really around time and motivation and energy and, and effort to build the course That's and so grow funny. the business. Because you say that, because th those are the objections with rise 25 that we get and we're like, well, right. It's the same reason why you haven't, you don't have time is the same reason you need to do it. Yeah. Right. Because it's going to actually save you time in the wrong, long run. Um, yeah. and so I want to talk about who, what are some of the popular courses that are on Thinkific? If you could name any of them. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, so we don't, I, I mean, again, we, we give like our clients, their website, their brand, yeah. their course. Um, so everyone's got their own unique and individual yes. businesses and confidentiality. I don't talk about, you know, yeah. how much they make or how much they sell unless they tell me that's okay. And For sometimes sure. they do, but some of the amazing ones I see, I mean, all over the map, I see some really cool stuff in, you know, areas you wouldn't expect, like serving the, the 50 plus empty nesters kind of, um, uh, baby boomers market. So everything from the arts and crafts to the more fun, um, I've got some spare time on my hands and I want to learn hobbies. That's a really interesting space because they have revenue. They're now online, um, you know, very internet and, and mobile capable and, uh, and interested in learning and doing new things. And they're not sort of done with learning and exploring. And, yeah. uh, and they've really accepted now this model of online learning as opposed to, say, going back to school for something. Mm. So there's a ton of interesting things in there in the craft space, some really cool stuff in sewing. Um, there's this woman, Mimi G Styles, who does some really cool sewing stuff. Very cool things in fitness. Um, one lady out of Australia doing hula hoop with Hoop Lovers TV. Mm, interesting. Started filming with a camera phone in the park, and now she's got a studio in her garage and a whole team and travels all over the world doing live events too. Um, so really building a business that leverages both yeah. online and live. And then into, uh, there's one guy locally here in Vancouver who does a thing called Corporate Finance Institute, and he teaches people around finance, actually even for businesses of financial planning and modeling and projections and spreadsheets and all the the really geeky finance stuff that I love. <laughs> uh, so he does some really interesting things there. So it's, it's all over the map. I one on, uh, flying drones and, um, flying drones. in the film industry. Interesting. Um, yeah. What about, so uh, an accountant just to give some, you know, viewers who are accountants or lawyers, obviously yeah. you have an LSAT one. Are there any other law, uh, lawyer courses that people have created and, or accountant? Accountants. Yeah, I, I love the I love the professions like that where they have a CPD, CPE, CLE kind of um, CE requirement because you really get two great markets uh, when you're creating. If you're an accountant uh, creating courses or a doctor creating courses or a lawyer, you have your own profession who has to take education or they're going to lose their career. They need yeah. that number of credits, so you can build for them. But on top of that, building that same course is something you can often offer to clients or potential clients to help build your brand build your um, authority as an expert in the area and even acquire clients or even, you know, give two clients for free. I mean, uh, the law firms I used to work with are constantly inviting me back to their offices to take courses or even to take online courses about the things they're experts at. And, and often they give them to me for free because it's a way of, uh, you know, showing me their expertise. And then, of course, I might have questions and follow up with a call to them, which generates the bigger fees of working with the law firm. So I see it as two great avenues for growing your business if you're a professional that way is one, getting off the dollars per hour and actually scaling and having revenue on a, on a digital product. And then the other is even just attracting new clients or giving something to your existing clients as a value add. So Greg, who should be using Thinkific, who's not? 
out there. <laughs> It's, uh, I mean, the, the future that I really yeah, see. Yeah, I mean, I mean specifically, like, are there certain influencers you're like, this person totally needs to start using things? <laughs> uh, Maybe someone out there knows them. I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, like a I'd hit a list, with, like with, top five, like this person, this person, this person needs to get on Thinkific. We could help them tremendously. Yeah, I had a good chat with Jack Canfield, and I know he does a ton in online education mm -hmm. and has a whole program all over the world around training the trainer, and he's an amazing guy. And mm -hmm. uh, we actually did an interview with him last year and chatted a bit about it, but he'd be a great one to, uh, to okay. get on the platform. Who else? <laughs> Anyone else? So if your buddies, you know, put in a good word for me. <laughs> yeah, there's actually one person I think uh, you should talk to regarding that, but actually this person specifically. Anyone else besides Jack Canfield that would be, that would be good? Uh, lots, lots more of my heroes, Vern Harnish, who does, uh, Rockefeller habits and, um, uh, and then, um, uh, Jim Collins with good to great, great by choice. I think the stuff that he does for CEO training is absolutely amazing. And I'd love to see him. Does he have uh, an online course to... somewhere or no? I don't, you know, I haven't actually checked. I should look that cause I, I listen to his stuff almost every day on the ride to work and I read his books at night on my Kindle and, um, I, uh, I should, should reach out and see. Mm. Um, so three last questions, Greg, and I always like to end, since it's Inspired Insider, I always like to ask about the lowest point and then mm -hmm. how you got through and then the proudest moment. Yep. What's been the lowest point? Uh, lowest was in those first three years, we probably had a ton of really lowest points, but yeah. um, I, uh, well, I co-founded it with my brother and he's absolutely amazing and amazing to work with, but in those first few years, we had a few low points where we were... Who's yeah, to older? be honest, a little bit, huh? Who's older? You uh, or I am your brother. You are okay. I'm I'm the oldest. So you just put him in a headlock and like just <laughs> no, and he no. submitted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just you know when you're when you're not sure where you're going or why you're doing it or, or I mean you know why you're doing it but you're not really sure if it's going to work and you're not sure if you're going to be able to make rent next month and you haven't paid yourself in a couple of years and uh, other than your online course revenue on the side which was really the thing that sustained us. Yeah. Um, it it becomes difficult and so it was it was really challenging and then I always found that we were both kind of going to the same place, but sometimes had a slightly different direction or vision as how to get there. And we're both um, pretty driven leaders. Like he's kind of helping lead his company now and I'm helping lead my company. And, and I think that works well, but having two really driven leaders in the same place when you're also not seeing a lot of success in the early days was really a, a struggle. So we definitely had some how do you resolve battles that there. How do you resolve it? Uh, well, I mean, we, we, uh, hey, did you was, go back to childhood? Like I'm going to play whoever wins this video game gets <laughs> to make the decision. <laughs> the thing I always tough. tried for is just to say, okay, that's your area. This is my area. Yeah. You're the boss there. I'm the boss here. And that, that generally worked pretty well. I was like, you okay, try and separate no. off what task people are in charge of. So that person gets kind of final veto. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it worked well for him on the development side. Cause it was like, well, I don't know how to develop software. <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> I don't know how to develop, write code. So whatever code you want to write, that's up to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think this is so common, right? I mean, yeah. it's like having another spouse. And yeah. then how do you resolve those, those disputes? Yeah. Yeah. But then we also shared a lot of expertise. So we're both strong on marketing side of things. So that's where we probably butt heads the most because we were both opinionated on that. But the, the nice thing is through all of that, it was, you know, we might fight vehemently at the office, which sometimes is a really good thing because you get to truth, you get to the right decision because we were always both arguing, not from an interest of self-interest, but of an interest of what's best for the company. And then we go and have Sunday family dinner together every week and everything was always good at that. So it was never, <laughs> never gotten the way of our relationship. That's good. That's hard. For tough times at work sometimes. That's tough. Yeah. Um, what about the, some of the proudest or a proud moment? From thick if out moments for me, the biggest ones have always been with people here on the team. I'd say in the last year and a half, two years, um, well, in the last year, we've gone from 20 people to 70 people. And wow. uh, holy cow, the it's the people here is just like finding someone come in who might be, you know, even new in the industry or new to a job or um, a bit more junior, and then just kind of giving them a lot of opportunity, doing a bit of coaching, and, and then letting them take it away and having them come back and just blow you away with what they're capable of. and you know you hired them for a reason because they they showed amazing things in that interview. But then when they come back, like you know, three months, six months later, and they're they're saying, "I'm going to take over this whole department and do a bunch of stuff mm. you've never even thought of." That's to me always the proudest moment is is yeah. recognizing that it's no longer 
me building this. It's everyone else here, and I'm just doing my best to support them. Yeah. Well, it goes back to the hiring, the building the team, and the training piece, right? And that you pick the right people, you know? Yeah. Um, Greg, this has been absolutely fantastic. I have one last question. Everyone should check out thinkific.com. It's T H I N K I F I C dot com. Um, you know, throughout this, I just feel you have a lot of knowledge and you love learning from mentors and from distant mentors and probably mentors. So I'm curious on the mentor side, who mm -hmm. your mentors and maybe personally or mentors that you, uh, you have a recommendation on like your people need to read these three books is these books changed my <laughs> life type of thing. Um, well, a good one. I'm just, just starting now, but I know the, the author is a coach of mine, coach Kevin Lawrence. And, um, What's the book? Uh, he's, it's called uh, Your Oxygen Mask First. Oh, cool. We all have to put link that up. Is it on yeah, Amazon? Yeah, it's, it's, okay. a, it's a great one around. Uh, it's funny because I, I, I bought it for myself. And then the day it arrived, uh, one of my team came and sort of addressed some of the concerns that she was facing that are exactly addressed in the mm -hmm. book. So I gave it to her. She took it home, read it. So I get you it back the tomorrow. the opposite of what the title says. <laughs> and, I, like, and I did make sure to... Do here is the book. <laughs> Yeah, I did just, make sure to point out the irony of that as exactly, I gave her the book. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to order some more copies. But like, uh, I'm putting on your but, oxygen mask first, even though the book says not to do that. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Kevin's amazing, and and uh, cool. I I know in skimming through it and now talking to Veronica, who's read it, it's it's got some okay. really good stuff, and it's really about um it's it's for leaders and and people in leadership positions really taking care of themselves first in order to be able to serve the team better because mm -hmm. we're getting to a lot of servant style leadership and and that can go so far that you forget to take care of yourself and then you let the team down too yeah any others uh i love everything by jim collins yeah everything yeah by just because it's all data and research based um rockefeller habits is huge the who book i mentioned um with for gh smart uh, Are you an audible I'll, person or do you like to read the physical book? So uh, this is, I've unlocked the secret to maximizing my reading. I yes. use, I get the book on Kindle and then you do usually a couple dollar upgrade to get it on audible and then you use whisper sync. So I will literally be like, I get out of bed, I'm listening to the audible in the shower. Yeah. Then I'm reading on the Kindle while I'm eating breakfast. Then I'm listening to audible in the car, reading in bed at night, back and forth. And it's constantly synced. So I do both. Mm. Are those your top ones on Audible or are there other ones you recommend? On Audible. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get a lot of those same ones on Audible. Uh, a really good one recently that I don't think is on Audible but is on, on, on uh, in paperback or Kindle or everywhere else is uh, um, High Output Management by Andy Grove from Intel. Hmm. Um, really good stuff there. Cool. Greg, thank you again. Everyone should check out thinkific.com. This was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.